Hey, Christopher, welcome. Um, sorry, this was a struggle to get my, uh, my, my Zoom learning curve. It seems to always uh, continue, no matter how many times I try this. So oh, I do <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to get to talk with you. You know, when we had the show in January, it was good to start to get to know you like at the opening a little more and at some of our conversations since then. But um, yeah, I, um, you know, in lieu of everything that's going on out there, this is, I think, a really good opportunity to kind of dive deeper with the artists we're working with. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm honored to get to get to do this with you. Um, yeah, yeah. So I figure for those of you that are, you know, for a lot of large part of our audience that might not know you really well, I think like a great starting place for, for you would be kind of what your starting place was, like what your entry point was into art. Because I think you, you more than um, many of our artists, I mean, you've had a long journey in art prior to entering clay. So I'd love to hear about maybe that part first before you even get to the clay part, if that's yeah. cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I always, when I was uh, in uh, high school and um, even before that, you know, I recognized that I had, you know, I could do stuff with my hands and I could draw things and paint things. And I remember my grandmother, uh, when I was uh, in um, adolescent, gave me some uh, oil paints that she had laying around. And I remember one of the first things that I did was like play with the oil paints. And, you know, like you get a piece of cardboard and you squirt oil paint out and mix it with things and see what kind of effects you get. At least that's what I did. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed the process. And uh, I think it really kind of opened up the idea to me as a young person like wow you know there's painting you know I looked at art and I looked at paintings uh you know back when you could go to bookstores like Barnes and Noble and uh, Borders and places like that and you know that's where you got some of your art history when the libraries didn't have uh stuff like that they had those big fancy uh uh coffee table books mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so yeah and um but I thought I wanted to be a musician uh I studied Blew pretty seriously uh, in school, and I thought I was when I went to college. I thought I was going to study music, um, but uh, things didn't work out that way, and so I ended up going into the service for four years, and um, decided that you know once I got out, I was going to go to school for painting and become an artist. I just you know that calling that I had didn't go away and it didn't go away. And it was really hard to say no to that. And even throughout the military, when I was in for four years, it was like, you know, it's just ever present, ever present, ever present. It's like, well, how do, uh, how do I figure out how to meet that? Well, I guess I go to college and, you know, and study and figure that out. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I studied painting and um, took a lot of printmaking classes. And uh, I had a really great professor in college, Michael Nekoneski. He's a Chicago imagist, just a really fantastic guy. And uh, just helped me kind of continue on the road that I wanted to go on. Just this very idiosyncratic kind of approach to image making, you know, which I don't know. And, and I stuck with painting for probably close to uh, 20 years. Um, hi, babies. My cat's coming in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. Okay. So, um, and then how did the painting evolve, I guess, for you? 20 years. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like when I got out of school, uh, I was very much interested in abstraction. Like that's, I thought that's what I would like the ideas that I had. I was like, I'm, I'm going to look at abstraction. I'm going to look at like big sort of philosophical concepts and ontology and uh, like, you know, like what does it mean to be embodied and be present and how can I express that in, in, in form in, in painting. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it shifted like really quickly. Like I think I spent the first, year and a half after I got out of college just doing abstract paintings and there was something that that didn't hit all the buttons for me and I always recognized this tension between like wanting to share stories and tell you know like a story that people could relate to making figurative work and then uh, making work that was just about, you know, being able to play with material, play with form, um, mixing waxes and plaster and playing with the viscosity of the paint and really getting the paint to a consistency. It was a lot like clay, which I always mm -hmm. discover later on, you know. Um, 
tearing into the paint and scoring the surfaces and, and, and creating the painting as an object, as a physical thing, as a thing in the world, as opposed to, you know, like a thing that you could get lost inside of. Yeah. And so uh, once I recognized that I had that kind of division, that, that friction zone in my work, that's really what I played with in my career was that, that balance between, you know, the, the, the story that I wanted to tell, the, the, the emotion, uh, the experience that I was relating, and then just that, that the, the physicality, the process, the material, and, and letting those two sort of burn and rub and buzz against each other and see what I could create out of that. And uh, it's fed my creative process for like this whole time. It's opened up like just lots of doorways for me. I'm loving, I'm showing some of these ink drawings here. Something I feel that connects all your work, whether it's paint, um, the ink work or the clay work is your, so your, you just talked about like kind of your approach to materiality, right? Like, like letting yeah. the material do it, do a thing. Um, but it's so fluid between all the different um, materials you're working with. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I feel like the energy carries through. Yeah, it's, you know, it's all flow and it's all form. It sounds like really woo, woo right? It's like, oh, you know, but it really is, you know? No, it's, yeah. It's, you can tell the same person has made all these. I feel like that's what, I, that's what I mean. It's like there's the same energy force that's making all these, whether it's like, you know, rigid lines in a drawing like this or I'll go backwards to like, you know, some of these, you know, um, yeah, there's just, there's a similar, and when you move even back into the paintings, I, I, it's, it's, it's very interesting seeing how all the work connects, from, at least from my vantage point. Yeah, and it's funny, in college, most of the classes that I took, like all my electives, and, then, and the work that I did after school is just this figure drawing, and figure drawing and figure drawing and like I just <laughs> relentless about it and to, 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 to learn it and to really learn uh, the human form and take that understanding and turn it inside out and push it into these things. Um, yeah. I was talking to somebody who visited the gallery for your show and they pointed that out to me, you know, they, and, and cause I don't look at, at drawings and paintings as much as, um, say critically but like intensely as i do ceramics but somebody mm -hmm. kind of pointed out to me that they they acknowledged your um your sense of uh of the figure meaning mm -hmm. um that you had created you have a technical background in it to then play with it to play back with it um what am i trying to say so like you know understanding anatomy of things and then um you know tweaking them in this case to make like these unique creatures and we same conversation, same same uh, patron. We're talking about the clay work in that way of like, even though you know they're sort of um, abstracted or surreal animals in some in some way, or like you know unrealistic physique, uh, they are realistic, right? Like you you've captured this, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, I guess like they're they're anatomical um, in their own way, right? I yeah. Don't know. Well, and that's been the real fun part about, the, about using clay. And uh, it's like taking these, these, these things which are just like, you know, they kind of spool out of line, right? Like I just put the pen to the paper and it's like, Whoa, and there they go. And mm -hmm. then you can figure out how to do that in three dimensions and, and actually realizing that, oh, you know, there's a really sophisticated kind of understanding of even what like in this drawing here, it seems almost childlike, you know? Um, yeah. But, it has a real volume, it has real form, space that it breathes in and, and something lives inside of it and it has presence, uh, which for me is like the most important thing, whether it's my work or uh, uh, any other's work, is I want that presence, I want that exchange, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like how you touched upon volume there too, because I think that's what I was not being as articulate as I wanted when I was trying to explain anatomy, right? It's like, yeah. these feel like even though they are in a way childlike, they feel like they could really exist in space. Um, there's a, and that's where I was referring to maybe like kind of your technique or your having a, having a good grasp of the, um, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of, of, of anatomy really. Um, and then, yeah, I think that you kind of hit it on the head. Like if then you're like, well, what would this look like if all of a sudden this thing was 3d, you know, so to go from line, um, and creating volume on a two-dimensional surface to creating it in in, uh, in real space. 
Yeah. Uh, which is so satisfying. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, to see what they become. I mean, they are. yeah, totally. I mean, I love that like trance place that I get into when I'm doing 2D work, you know, like the pen and ink work is very meticulous. I use a nib and it's like, it just, it unfolds and it's intuitive. And I just sort of let this thing emerge. It starts from the inside out, you know, but like with the clay, when you're like, it's hollow and you're, pulling, pushing, and stretching the clay, and it's just, the way it responds, and that conversation that you have with it is, um, it's a little bit different. It touches all these different buttons in my brain when I want to work with it, which I absolutely love. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I love how the finished clay pieces, they still feel that as visceral as, as like this drawing, for example, right? They, mm -hmm. The energy is, again, that's where I keep coming back, like the energy, the fluidness, they feel like they just, they came out really quickly, even though you and I and most most of our uh, folks listening, you know, know that like clay is not, you know, just like, whoop, there's a tail, you know, spin it around and voila, the tail just did this, um, that it is. It's like, you know, coiling and slabbing and, and letting things dry and, you know, coming back yeah. to it and coming back to it and coming back to it. Um, but, which oftentimes I find some artists can struggle with, um, keeping things like alive, you know, and keeping like this, this, uh, the essence of the, of like the character of the um, creature. Um, and I sometimes see that there's like a sterility to it, which, which, uh, you, you know, don't have a problem with. I mean, that's what I love about the work is that it keeps coming back to they, there's a, there's a, um, a vivacious or they're, they're, they're alive, you know? Um, and then an obvious one that I was pointing out, you know, when I was talking to a lot of folks, um, initially with the work um, here in the back room was um, I love that you know that your surface on the, on the and actually I'll skip over to some of these clay ones so I can kind of get visual as we're talking and we'll come back I want to come back and make sure we talk about the crossing here of course um, but the surfaces um, I think you keep that energy too right like the you know the way um, like you, you called it with the drawing, like kind of trance-like, um, I would imagine that you're, you know, once the, the figure, so to speak, is built, that it's very, you're kind of fi still finding those process moments that you find in your illustrations too. Yeah, for sure. It's like I was able to figure out how to get the same uh, kind of mark making on the surface yeah. of my forms as I was doing it, as I do in my uh, pen and ink drawings and just translating that facility. Um, which surprised me when, when it worked so well and uh, with, with these. Oh, I love that guy so much. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we got, I think he's the one that's going to go to the Cascade AIDS project. Yeah, it is. It was one, one of the, the one I Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we got that going. I guess I can tell you now, I'm pretty sure we're going to get that one into the live auction, actually. Oh, right on. Yeah, yeah. So working with them, we got... Um, I was able to narrow, I think it's, I can have 25 pieces in the live auction. So um, I, I had two other people, you know, I'm technically the curator, but I had to, I had to sort of go, it still is jury by committee uh -huh. uh, for, for some of that stuff. But yeah, it was, uh, I'm really excited that this year because to have your work and a few other artists that we work with, um, historically there's a very, you know, it's, it's primarily painting. So to get, to get three-dimensional work in the, on the live auction is going to be pretty cool. Cool. Yeah, so I'm excited. Um, so maybe, I mean, I, I kind of jumped right into the clay stuff, but maybe backing up a little bit, um, if you want to touch more upon your transition from from 2D and, and how you found clay, like how clay came into your, your practice. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think throughout my, my painting career, I, I dabbled in sculpture a little bit. I uh, created some mixed media works with like uh, found wood and nails and twine and I really liked using uh, jute to wrap materials because uh, it's a great uh, it's, a, it's a really absorbent uh, uh, material and you can paint on it and uh, when the, uh, the, the the fibers get uh, coated with with paint and they, they it gets kind of furry and scraggly and it just it does there's something really neat when it does that it does to the form and uh, when you wrap it um so you know I, 
been interested in that, but like, I don't think that I transitioned into something that was practical as far as doing sculpture. Uh, you know, I looked a lot of Carl, like Carl Apple, uh, who did these great assemblages, you know, and his, his uh, sculptures are just like so much fun and, and they have that visceral and wild quality to them. But I didn't really want to do that, mostly for storage. It's like I can't store giant blocks of wood and carve hands and things like that. So there was some of the practicality, but, um, you know, always going to museums, I was always finding myself drawn to uh, the, uh, excuse me, uh, the clay work in uh, okay. museum collection. So I'd go and I'd look at Mesoamerica and South America and, you know, look at their, their pottery forms. And I, I found much more excitement in that and the image decoration, just the form, uh, than I did looking at, you know, 19th century or Rococo or whatever uh, paintings, uh, European painting, European art. And I was kind of bored with it and bored with modernism and, you know, contemporary works. I was like, you know, I don't really want to see this, but like the clay stuff, I'm like, wow, this is really cool stuff. So I always kept that in the back of my ear for a long time. And uh, two and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to um, meet uh, Shelley Fredenberg, who's a clay ceramic artist. And uh, we had this idea that we were going to uh, collaborate together on, uh, on a show that we did uh, called Singing the Animal, Singing the Earth. And she was going to do clay works and I was going to do 2D works. And uh, somewhere in between, we would collaborate on works together where either it would be surface decoration on my part and clay work that she did, or um, I don't know, we were trying to figure it out. And in that process, like just working with her and her showing me some some things about clay and how to work with it, it just like my brain exploded. <laughs> it was like I was like, oh, this is what I have to be doing, and uh, I kind of did a one I don't know 180 on my life and completely changed a lot of things just so I could uh, be in this place uh, and in this situation to learn clay. And I've spent the last two and a half years just really intensively just working with clay and, you know, just starting with really simple pinch pots. Uh, mm -hmm. That's like the first thing that I started with to, you know, figuring out how to build uh, these things. And, you know, I, I had this idea that I wanted to take these, these, these animals and this, this kind of ecological message that was percolating in my brain um, and, you know, turn them into something that was a lot more visceral and physical and real and in the world and sort of add that to my vision and, and you know, and that connection to people because this is, this is a conversation about compassion and, you know, getting people to realize it's like, you know, you are connected to other things in the world besides a human face and a human form. You know, we live in an ecosystem and it's like, that's the message that I wanted to get across. And I thought clay uh, was just a really great place to do that and was positive. Um, I think in the slideshow, uh, this, the paintings that I show start from around 2016 and they're paintings mm -hmm. that I did right after the election and uh, I like a lot of people was really uh, uh, yeah. devastated um, by the election and the results of what happened and I had to figure out like how to do this how to be an artist and not want to blow my brains out because I was so frustrated with you know, the way yeah. things are going. It's like my mental health matters as a creative person and my mental health matters to what I'm bringing to people. My vision is as an artist to deepen connection, to enrich compassion and empathy and, you know, just try to make things better uh, for, for everybody. So I ditched the figure and I ditched painting. I haven't, I haven't painted in over, you know, since I, this year I started a little bit of painting before mm -hmm. uh, COVID, but um, I, I, I gave up painting to learn ceramics. And um, it's probably been one of the most beneficial things I've done, in my, at least in my personal practice and in my personal life, for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, you know, you said it way back when you were talking about the painting and you were approach in a way, I think you were already thinking of the paint in a sculptural way. Um, you were talking about the surface and building it up to scratch, to score through it. Yeah. So there was already, it was already like resided in you that you were looking, to, I feel like that it was there, you know? Yeah. Um, very interesting. Yeah. Now that I look back on those, those images, we'll, we'll scroll through them again, but I can kind of see maybe some of the, some of the post-election uh, anger um, 
of, let's see, let's see if there's a way to flip back here. Um, yeah, gosh. Um, well, let, let's tell me, tell us all about the crossing and, and this, that whole experience. So that was also with Shelly. Shelly, you got you involved in that or, how, or why don't you start there? Sorry. Oh gosh. So, um, if you want to show the birds, cause that's, okay. a, that's a good place to start the, 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 the next slide after, uh, Shelly Fredenberg and the crossing. There we go. And yeah. The, so. Uh, Shelly and I had this idea that we were going to create this exhibition around an ecological message and we were going to connect, um, you know, uh, we we're going to look at the extinction event that we're living through uh, mm -hmm. and uh, climate change and human impact on climate change. And we were going to look at it through a positive lens and try to figure out how to use the space. It was the Mod Kearns, which is an old church. Um, to uplift people and to create a really positive awareness of sort of the uniqueness of being on this planet, you know, which is so crazy. It's the only one that we know about that's like this, right? And that's, yeah. fun. you know, um, we wanted to link that to uh, personal tragedy. And um, we had the Salon Gallery at the Mod Kearns, uh, where we created a suite of I, nine birds and a central piece, a ceramic piece that Shelley did, uh, which details an incident that happened in her life where her sister and um, eight other people were killed in a bus accident, um, oh. a really tragic one in Montana. Um, and the funny thing about this, this story is that so when we decided to do this, we didn't know that we were going to talk about this incident that happened in our life. We didn't know that I was going to do these birds. I didn't know that the number of birds that I was going to do was was going to correspond to the people who died. I didn't know that she was going to delve into her grief so much. And I didn't know at the same time that my old friend, Donald Nally, who's the conductor of the crossing, was following me and was planning on reaching out to me and being involved, having me get involved with their uh, 2019, uh, 2020 concert season. So there's this, like in January of last year, there was all this really weird confluence of things which we didn't really articulate. Um, mm -hmm. So I did these birds, uh, which are pen and ink. They're fairly large, 20, 20 26 by 30, I think, uh, kind of full size sheets. Um, and uh, they used uh, the previous image for uh, their uh, first release, their, their, their CD release, uh, The Ark in the Sky, which is composed by Kyle Smith. Um, I met Donald when I was living in New Mexico about 11 years ago. Okay. Uh, just doing um, booth shows. And he just stopped by and was uh, struck by the work and had a comment. I don't even remember him. We were talking about this uh, yesterday. And it's like, do you even remember me? And I'm like, no, I don't remember you at all. Uh, but he's been following my career. And uh, like, you know, he reached out to me at the completion of those drawings and said, hey, would you like to be involved in this project with the crossing? And I was like, yeah. Uh, and so I, we finished that show and then I created an additional body of work to go along with their, their concert season, all of which was tied to the theme of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this ecological message, this extinction mm -hmm. of climate change, all that. That was their focus of their, their concert season. So, and that's what we've been kind of working together on. And then, um, and forgive my naivety here, but then are these displayed in the, like what's, um, is there a relationship between the, like are these, the artwork um, that's displayed during the, the concerts or how, how are the, how are they sort of shared? Right, so um, the, the drawings were used on their uh, CD release, uh, which was nominated for a Grammy. Um, yeah. uh, that artwork was used for the packaging and the production of, of that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, uh, the other ones like this bear with the watercolor and the other images that I did have been used for with, uh, their, uh, concert material. They published a brochure 
that they hand out to all of their uh, their concert goers, uh, which is really, it was really beautiful um, the way they put it all together. It's on their website. They have some merchandising. So it, they've used like it's these- all, Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, it's like all intertwined in different sort of intersecting points then. It's yeah. not just, yeah, yeah, okay. Th thank you for clarifying, yeah. Um, oh, that's phenomenal. And then you had kind of mentioned you were, you were pretty excited about some up and coming stuff with them. Are you able to share that now, or do we, have, or should we wait with any? No, we stuff? can talk about it. So they, what they last Christmas they wanted to do. They Donald is really uh, loves these sculptures that they're doing too, and we were talking about this idea of doing this processional of uh, animal sculptures uh, and and having some sort of backdrop behind the choir of like like a wall of drawings or or something like that. They do some really great productions. Uh, they do this uh, this thing in Big Sky, Montana, where they do like a 24-hour long performance of, um, and uh, just, it's, I don't know, they're really great. Uh, uh, but so that's what we're talking about. That didn't materialize this this uh, Christmas, and so we're yeah. doing that uh, next spring. I think that's, that's the idea that we're batting around right now. Okay. Awesome. Um, what else was I going to ask you about? Oh, well, yeah, when we first met, um, you were already, you, I mean, you, you already have an extensive, obviously painting and, um, drawing career prior to, to us sort of inter interconnecting with, um, with the ceramic work specifically. Um, you've been showing in France for how many years? You've been working with a specific gallery there? Yeah, eight years now. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> how how did that come to be? If you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about that, I mean, I I find like we see, you know, it, it, um, how would I put it? Uh, you know, we we're importing artists, if anything, uh, mm -hmm. it seems more more common. So I think that's like really unique and exciting that it's like, you know, that that you have a career in France as well um, as what you're doing here in the states. Yeah, I when I, I lived in Hawaii. And I was showing uh -huh. a little gallery called Bethel Street Gallery. Um, this guy named Bryant McNeil, who lives in Japan, he's a bass player and this painter and this really like wonderful human being from Detroit. Uh, saw, okay. some, saw some of my work there, bought some paintings. Um, knew the owner of this gallery in, in France, uh, Dominique Sablon, uh, who worked for Lucas Arts and in Lucas Arts France, and like you know was involved in those kinds of projects ended up selling their house in in in, in paris and moving out to le Bogio, which is this tiny little village out in, the, out in the jura um so bryant uh showed dominique the painting that he bought for me and then dominique just contacted me and said i love this do you want to show with me and then onward from like uh, how how often do you show with with them or how, how does that a relationship like that work yeah um they so in, at least in that part of France, they have an exhibition season, which runs from uh, June until October, basically the vacation season. And, so, okay. and then they close from November until April. So this gallery is only open seasonally, um, but they prepare uh, like a new exhibition season. They have like a core roster of artists uh, who are mostly all French. There's one from Siberia. Um, there's another artist from Sweden. They have another, they have a ceramic artist from Japan this year. Um, and then they try to bring in someone that's somebody new. But then, you know, it's, uh, I think that people looking at this gallery would identify this, this work as art brute or maybe a little bit more outsider. Um, okay. But in France, I think they call it art singulier, which is more, uh, it's like work that is uh, very emotionally strong, which gives it a sort of uh, an idios idiosyncratic um, look to it not necessarily like outsider in the way of like being having a mental illness or a physical challenge or something like that but just you know very outsider like qualities uh, and that's yeah. what that's what Dominique and Francois uh, really loved they loved to work with a very strong perspective uh, and you know unafraid of, of talking about maybe difficult things and the work that I started showing with them was you know really large-scale figurative work um, and raw and explosive and lots of materials and mixed media um, and that's what I started showing with them for the first three or four years um, yeah okay and then that work has evolved into some of maybe what we've seen today yeah 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 
but they have um, like so much of it they've like it's been like just this year they're starting to show my ants and like i started doing ants in my work like three or four years ago before i started doing them in my plates because I, I love ants and <laughs> there's so much fun to do so they're just showing that work now because they have lots of my stuff <laughs> that's funny okay do you find it with any of the animals are you do you do you um directly use like any symbolism with the animals like when you just brought up ants it just made me think of another artist that we worked with over the years that um he's from mali uh, africa originally and so certain animals mean certain things to him i know you spoke more generally about um i think kind of identifying like personality maybe beyond what kind of animal it is but i had never thought to ask actually like if, when you choose a particular sort of uh species if if that has uh much impact or if it's more just about the the personality of the of the creature itself sure um you know rabbits started cropping up in my work like really early for some reason and i and i think mm -hmm. that i tried to to use that as a symbol and to direct that i know like post 9 11 and post uh 2016 election i was using rabbits to talk about the culture of fear in america and to talk okay. about the rabbit as a symbol of, 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 of the fearful populace, um, you know, and uh, the ears are definitely all about listening. And I'm always trying to clue people in to, to kind of be quiet a little bit and pay attention more because it's, it's a very noisy world out there. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yes. A lot of noise. Um, and that kind of brings me back to what I think you started to talk about, too, with the animals is, is um, and really a lot, I think a lot of it, a lot of your work about the message that you're one, one of several, I think messages you're sending about, um, uh, I don't want to just loosely say community, but like you, we, we, we talked a little bit at length when um, we were preparing for these calls about um, com compassion, you know, and, uh, and paying attention to what's going on out there. Um, would you, would you mind elaborating a little bit more on your feelings around that? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of distractions um, mm -hmm. around us that, you know, it's it's easy to hide in and it's easy to uh, not take responsibility for the world that you live in. And even in just small ways, um, you know, just this whole COVID-19 thing, you know, it's amazing to me that like, you know, so the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, the Great Recession, um, you know, the, I don't, I didn't see those events galvanize and change human beha behavior as much mm -hmm. as this pandemic has, you know, like we can yeah. watch it in real time that everything shut down and we saw the immediate impact of that shutdown, you know, the skies are clearer, you know, the, the nature kind of rebounded a little bit. We haven't fixed mm -hmm. anything, but you know, there was a pause and people did yeah. that, you know? And so if we can see that and then engage with our compassion to go, oh yeah, you know, we've been having an impact and we've been affecting this and pushing and pushing and pushing, you know, maybe we can in use that, that moral sense that we have to, you know, try to shift this conversation and make things better. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's a finite world. We have finite resources. That whole thing with Greenland that they were throwing smoke screen ups because they, you know, with the, the, the glaciers receding there and, you know, as a result of global warming, they want access to resources. I say they, you know, but, you know, United yeah. States companies, mining companies, you know, um, mm -hmm. our resources are very limited and the quality of life that people uh, can enjoy is going to be seriously diminished generation after generation if we continue you know operating the way we have been um and how do you shift that well you just make small changes in the way that you can at least that's what my philosophy as an artist it's like well how can i change the conversation well i can you know open somebody's heart up a little bit and make it harder for them to shut down mm -hmm. well and i think and i know this is probably stating the obvious but um communicating visually through art um, you can capture a part of someone's heart better than, or ear, or even mine, right? Better than mm -hmm. you could having a political debate with them, right? Or telling them 
what's good and what's bad about the environment or what's good or what's bad about, you know, particular politics. But that um, I'm going to keep coming back to that word that just really resonated with me when we spoke earlier um, uh, a couple of weeks back was the, the word, you know, compassion, you know, so, yeah. um, garnering a sense of that through the, through the work and, and finding things like that. It, we, we bring that back to ourselves and to our, our friendships, our communities, our, our you know, families, friends, um, and then hopefully that those those are the little changes I like to you know imagine seeing in the world is that um, through each person that experiences particular pieces of art, um, and I'll just speak kind of generally, like I guess even just any any piece of art in the gallery that that they leave with something that um, it goes out in the world and and we've improved in, in some way you know uh, even if there's not an intellectual understanding of of it, but it, it translates it could hopefully translate to something like that and those little small changes actually uh, add yeah, and you know like with making an art object we take lots of information that we're not even conscious of because we all have access mm -hmm. to the ocean right and and we bring it and we embody it in some way and so those things that we do that we create they're having an impact and effect on people in ways that we don't even like anticipate you know mm -hmm. and so if our intention is 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 as strong and our intention is as pure as it can be i think compassion is a really noble thing uh to um to 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 uh facilitate uh with an audience for sure mm -hmm. um and it's kind of a long roundabout one but uh, one of my last questions for you was kind of how how you see um support you know and, and um i know we talked um about community i was kind of rambling on about like you know after covid there's this interesting change of course i don't have people physically entering this space and I, you know of course we, we can both relate to how odd that is when people don't experience the work um in the round in the flesh mm -hmm. um but it's been interesting i mean the way that i've seen support and, and wanted to ch you know change some of our programming that i think will you know forever impact us as a gallery um it's just more interaction, you know, because I think some of what I'm starved of is is those those visits and those um, those conversations that come out of someone interpreting the work or having an experience with a particular um, piece. Uh, so yeah, yeah I'm kind of curious. Like as uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gallery, right? I, I guess you know, maybe not, but I'm really curious, kind of your perspective as an individual artist of sort of. You know, other than the obvious, I mean, I know we all need to sell work, pay bills mm -hmm. and those sort of things, but um, I feel like there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's other deeper senses of support that, that you and I were kind of brushing upon earlier that I thought was special. Um, yeah. Ah, support. You know, recognition, I think, is like, Re at least for me, it's really important, um, and not just not just the recognition that you're, um, you know, trying to make a living, but a recognition that you know this this practice is uh, is, is is noble. Uh, mm -hmm. that it supports the cultural fabric that we share as a nation, you know, and mm -hmm. um, support for which we don't have as much at the federal level as we used to. Um, so anything that we can do to further those conversations with people in ways that allow us to suspend judgment, um, mm -hmm. you know, cause sometimes like looking at this time, like things that you wouldn't necessarily make something that is obvious that it looks like the time that you're representing. It's a very confusing time and like what this time feels like you know, mm -hmm. for, for people and, and being, being able to be present to, to other people and what they're bringing to conversations. And rather than saying, well, that'll never sell, you know, saying, what's your perspective? Uh, what are you trying to do? What's your intention? You know, um, it's very competitive as, you know, as artists. And I, I've been finding myself um, reminding myself to be less judgmental and less, hard on 
people whose you know whose work I may not like, but like you know, sure. really trying to like, okay, what are they doing? What are they trying to see? And just being more supportive. It does you know, and and what way I can contribute to the conversation that they're having, and and maybe you know, um, make this richer. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I, uh, briefly on that, I think you, you know, you and I were talking too about like, and, and I don't mean it like that an artist directly represents a community, but even if you didn't, you know, jive with somebody's work, um, there's a level of respect to what they're doing that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to form a platform to share and, and support, mm -hmm. um, kind of bring back that energy to others around them. There's, there's something else, yeah. kind of that ripple effect. And I, um, I think that was something special that uh, I was thinking about with you as well. Um, you know, aside from your, um, you know, your art making, which can be private, there's just the sharing of it and uh, what you bring, bring out into the community is, um, is, is, is potent or powerful as well and, and um, important. Yeah, it's and, and it's really important to encourage people not to be afraid. Like I love teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, I teach figure painting and figure drawing classes and yeah, yeah. art history things. Uh, and you know, like getting my students just to take risks, just to do something that doesn't feel comfortable. It's like yeah. you no, know, outside your comfort zone. It's going to be okay. You're okay. Like that's support, and that's you know when 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 students have that and they make that little breakthrough and they move forward. That's really magical. You know, and yeah. there's nothing like that. Yeah, I love seeing that through both the act of teaching and making, and, and I see it, of course, even when people come in and view, like like the risk of um, engaging, you know, yeah. verbally about a piece or, or interacting with it. Um, you know, I have a lot of schools that, which right now we're doing some of this virtually, but um, that send their students through and it amazes me how nervous some of them are just to enter a space like this. I mean, I've had people walk into our space and it just goes to show like where different people are at with what they're, they're understanding what a gallery is. But I have people come in sometime to ask if there's an entry fee. You know, and say, no, no, this is free. Like you can come anytime you want and see artwork. And, you know, I'll be here to talk to you about it. And they're like, wow, like what, that's a thing. Like you can just like go, you know, go into a, a space and uh and have that experience and it's not you know there's not an admission fee like, no there's not it's uh yeah it's funny yeah it's, it's a public kind of good it belongs to all of us yeah yeah so that making is it's, it's the same it's, yeah um well hey we should probably wrap up with our time i wanted to also call out uh that i'm excited um to continue to work with you and, and specifically that, you know, one of the things you and I started to map out, which I'm especially excited about is, is doing this again. Um, Cause I feel like we have a lot more than, you know, trying to condense life into an hour. Um, I think this is like a great start to kind of like, for I'll loosely say like get to know each other, but I, I think it'll be really fun for you and I to continue to check back like every few months and, and post these, so we can see what you're working on, how things are going, um, and just carry on these conversations, you know, at, at different depths. Um, I think that'll be really rewarding for, for me. I, ho I hope as well as for you. Yeah, for sure. We can talk about E.O. Wilson. I love E.O. Wilson. Oh my God. There we go. All right. Next one. <laughs> cool. Um, well, again, Christopher, thank you so, so much for all your time. And, um, yeah, we'll, uh, We'll be in touch soon. Okay, thank, thank you. So much, Brett, and like, yeah, I'm really honored to be working with you. Well, likewise, I look forward to continue to build in our relationship. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Awesome, man. Well, have a great day. Okay, thanks. Catch you.